thanks to the organizers for the invitation uh, to speak. My greetings from Atlanta, Georgia, where it's still very early. Um, and so I shall try to say Byzantine instead of Byzantine, so as to perhaps uh, fit in with all of you a bit better. So I've been tasked uh, for today's talk with a rapid overview of the relations between climate culture and water in early Byzantium, how urban water supply changed in early Byzantine cities is clear. Why? Uh, rather less so. To be brief on the how, older wells and cisterns were infilled and went out of use in many Roman cities soon after aqueducts were constructed, often in the first or second century AD, as is well understood, for instance, at Pompeii or Ostia. This change is indicative of narrowing water portfolios in cities as they became more dependent on aqueducts, which were charged with the symbolism of empire and urbanitas. Yet aqueducts and baths gradually retreated from urban landscapes after about 400 or so, lingering longer in some locations that took state priority, provincial capitals, seaside ports, uh, or pilgrimage centers. Uh, Ephesus, for instance, is all three. There is also clear preferential uh, survival for technologically simple systems, such as found at Mira um, in Lycia or Samos on the Aegean, both naval bases uh, with simple rock cut tunnels connecting a spring to a city. These are actually like Iron Age systems, but that persisted until the Middle Byzantine period at least. Uh, longer or technologically complex systems with pressurized, uh, what we call inverted siphon systems or otherwise, were abandoned more quickly, uh, sometimes after catastrophes, um, including earthquakes. Reservoirs and cisterns reappear in early Byzantine cities, Byzantine, pardon me, the latter with new and cutting edge columnar architectural formats for large scale water storage, unlike anything that existed in Roman centuries previous, uh, alongside elaborate wells that aggrandized uh, ground, groundwater resources in new ways. Such changes of emphasis coincide with more utilitarian uses of aqueduct water in the progressively ruralized and industrialized late antique city, illustrated so well by the cascade of water mills for grinding grain into flour and stone columns into panel revetments installed within the terrace houses in the heart of Ephesus uh, after 400 AD. Now, was climate change a factor in this evolution? This question requires that we compare the evidence of regional proxies for climate with the textual and archeological evidence for changing habits of water supply and consumption. So today I'll divide up my talk into these three sections. First, um, climate change mechanisms. So Roman and early Byzantine urban water systems were highly susceptible uh, to climate change. And this has a really simple explanation that's rooted in geology. Um, as Dora Crouch has explained, Roman aqueducts were sourced from springs and aquifers located in karst or limestone, which is so abundant throughout the provinces of the former Roman Empire. Karst limestone acts as a giant rainwater catchment, naturally channeling, collecting, and storing rainwater to emerge in springs at the bases of hills and mountains. Roman aqueduct engineers chased those springs by following the tributaries of rivers uphill from where springs could be channeled through masonry and brick structures to cities at lower elevations for distribution and consumption. So what's the climate mechanism? The output of karst springs is wholly dependent on precipitation. And precipitation, right, is variable, one, intra-annually from month to month, typically much greater winter rainfall across the Mediterranean, two, interannually from year to year with dramatic highs and lows, even within a few decades, as we can see here from the data at Zakynthos, and three, also at you know, longer centurial or millennial scales, reflective of wider oscillations in planetary climate. So successively uh, rainy, wet years, right, would enhance flow output from karst springs at the source of aqueducts, with flow through limited only by the physical dimensions of their channels. A few years or decades of surplus precipitation might create more perceived options for supply or consumption, whether for baths or fountains or domestic hookups. Uh, greater need for improved drainage uh, could be a negative consequence. Dry years with less rain portended uh, supply side pressure on aqueduct springs and diminished availabilities of water. 
Declining precipitation in the years after an aqueduct's design could prompt change in infrastructure. The addition of more springs, more storage in the form of cisterns or reservoirs, more groundwater sources via wells, or perhaps uh, the modification of extant infrastructure, uh, for instance, to shrink fountain basins and thereby make less water available to consumers. Uh, this latter practice or phenomenon is well documented at Sagalasas and here at Jirasa, for instance. Uh, changes in social relations surrounding water usage, for instance, via legal restrictions, are another possibility for coping with water scarcity. Okay, part two, knowledge gaps. Any assessment of climate change's role in water infrastructure evolution should, of course, involve comparison between archaeology, historical testimonia, and climate proxy data. Climate proxies of whatever sort remain unevenly distributed, but for investigation of water histories, speleothems might be favored for their close relation to karst and to moisture and precipitation thereby. Speleothems are still lacking in some key areas. So for instance, uh, while Northern Syria is really rich, right, for published settlement and for architecture, we don't really have good proxies uh, for that region. Western Anatolia too, home to some of the most famous cities of antiquity, uh, but we have no speleothems with which to compare. Urban change in the Eastern Adriatic as related to climate also remains rather mysterious. Uh, the situation is similar in Cyprus and Crete, or Egypt and North Africa. On the other hand, Italy uh, has improved lately with recent publications deriving from the Rinella speleothem, including this paper that came out just last week uh, with Kevin Bloomfield and Adam Izdebski and other colleagues. Textual sources with details on water infrastructure are concentrated on the major capitals, Constantinople, Thessaloniki, Antioch and Jerusalem, besides Rome. And on the other hand, even major cities, right, with long archaeological histories like Ephesus or Corinth, they lack comparably detailed historical sources outside of inscriptions. Archaeology is regrettably even more uneven in terms of regional and urban geographies. So we have like an aqueduct here, a bath there, right, but also in terms of the history of practice and method. Earlier 20th century digs revealed urban architecture from large scale clearance in cities like Antioch, but really without the stratified ceramics that today can provide at best maybe half or quarter century chronologies beyond those rougher relative dates inferred from architecture. Now, these are satisfactory for, for cultural and a lot of socioeconomic questions, but they stand increasingly at odds with the nearer to annual resolution of paleoclimate proxies and the needs of environmental history. So what is absolutely required going forward, therefore, is more robust scientific and absolute dating of organic remains, but also rather more novel approaches, such as direct carbon dating of ceramics or of mortar. In the Eastern Mediterranean, absolute dating is limited um, for the Roman and Byzantine periods. And unfortunately, the structure of permits for archeological projects and for the export of samples will continue to make this difficult uh, whether for a single project uh, or for the comparative multi-site approach that's needed to answer so many questions uh, about water history. Okay, part three, a case study from Constantinople. So Constantinople provides one good opportunity for the comparison of a climate proxy, the speleothem at Uzuntarla, with a rich historical and textual record and immense archeological and hydraulic data, thanks to James Crow, and his cohort of colleagues, um, including Karim Altu, Federica Ruggieri, uh, Kate Ward, John Bartle, and Richard Bayless. So there are two major aqueducts for Constantinople, right? So first was the, was the Hadrianic aqueduct that supplied the lower city, ordered by Hadrian during a visit in 123 AD, and functioning to supply the city at elevations below 35 meters in the old city and around the Great Palace. Later came the two-phase aqueduct of Valens, which by 373 had connected the city's elevations above 35 meters to the nearer western karst springs at Pasha, Kainarja, and Punarja. Sometime between 380 and the early 400s, the system was extended considerably further west to springs from Pizarla, Ergene, and Binkulich uh, near Vize. 
precipitation in the city of Constantinople uh, can be compared with the Sofular speleothem, which shares the capital's intensely pontic climate. But the Uzuntarla speleothem is better for thinking about Constantinople's aqueducts, uh, whose springs around Vizay are sourced in the same limestone of the Strania Massif with the climate record that combines Black Sea, Thracian, and Marmoran circulation patterns. The primary driver for aqueduct construction and extension under Valens and his successors in the late 4th or early 5th century was certainly the rapid growth of the city in population um, and amenities as required by its new status as capital. But climate should also be considered. Those decades when Valens' long-distance system was first designed and constructed between 360 and 373, when Jerome records its completion, oscillated near to the average carbon isotopic values for effective moisture in the region of the springs reflected by the Uzuntarla record. And so the dotted line here um, on the record reflects uh, the average for 330 to 1453. The extension of this system to Vizay, on the other hand, between 380 and 400 or so, corresponds with a period of uh, rather drier conditions in the Uzuntarla proxy. By this measure, the pressure of population growth on water supply would have only compounded under deteriorating climatic conditions. Following a momentary spike in moisture around 400, the Uzuntarla speleothem indicates a sharp downward trend persisting until 480 or so, followed by a brief spike and then another low around 525, which could have introduced problems for the intended functionality of the city's water system with declining outflows from Thracian springs. Belonging to this period of heightened aridity after 400 to 480 and again around 525 are many of the city's greatest hits, right? Uh, for water storage, so the Edius Reservoir from around from 420, uh, the Philoxenus cistern, if it is to be identified with uh, Bindir Direct uh, from 4 425, the Aspar Reservoir from 459, and the Basilica Cistern from 526. Uh, Procopius is famously quite clear when he describes how storage of overflow from the aqueducts for use in times of dearth was reason for the Basilica Cistern's construction. He thereby points to the seasonal variability in spring outflows, as Crow has observed, if not also to the heightened interannual and decadal variability that is suggested by the Uzuntarla climate record. The work of Karim Altu and Kate Ward has, in parallel, suggested that approximately two-thirds of the city's many smaller cisterns, over 300 total, were also built during late antiquity uh, rather than the middle uh, or late Byzantine periods. And so the really the fifth or sixth century is to be preferred here. Uh, during this period of lessened moisture and heightened volatility from 400 to 480 and around 525, uh, we also find a rapid succession of legal restrictions placed on the usage of water. Such legal rejoinders include the cancellation of all rights to water from Hadrian's aqueduct to favor the Great Palace in 440, reminders to the praetors and the consuls to never redirect funds intended for upkeep of the aqueducts in 451, and multiple edicts declaring penalties up to 10,000 pounds of gold, that's a lot, uh, for those who dared to divert water from aqueducts in 517. Such, le um, such legal actions are reminiscent of Frontinus in the De Aquis, which surveys the waterworks of Rome uh, around 100 AD. Frontinus's work was driven by the hunt for thieves who stole water from the system by diversion. However, his ignorance of a method to measure water's velocity, which prevented him from calculating water volume in the system, led him to fundamental errors of judgment, including probably the prevalence of water theft. The parallel here is, perhaps, that volatility or the perception of sharp year-over-year -year declines in water output from the aqueducts, which can have climatic uh, factors, could prompt legal pronouncements concerning illegal diversion uh, or uh, investigations of water rights and so forth, as well as repairs, uh, to which I now turn. A third phase in the city's hydraulic history might be identified as one of repair and consolidation between 540 and 600. Now, the plethora of contributing factors makes conditions during this period really difficult to disentangle. 
besides earthquakes attested at Constantinople in 525 and 533 and 542 and 546, we might note the sharp decline in moisture indicated, indicated by the Uzantarla record from 520 to 540, to which period belongs not only the Basilica cistern in 526, but also repair of Valens aqueduct under Justinian, as indicated by distinctive masonry and an inscription of Longinus, who's consul in 541, on bridges in the hinterland, um, as found by James Crow. Further repairs under Justin II in 575 might be associated with further year-on-year -year declines in moisture, not long after a famous drought in 562, uh, one of my favorite anecdotes in Constantinople's water history, when, quote, murders occurred round the fountains uh, for lack of water. The Fildama Reservoir, thought to belong to the period sometime after Justinian, and another repair of the aqueducts during the reign of Morris, uh, 582 to 602, uh, remain more difficult to associate with the rapid oscillations of climate during these decades, however. Last thing. The Valens Aqueduct was cut during the Avar Siege of 626. And while the old city and the area of the Great Palace, it seems, were still served by Hadrian's low-level aqueduct, those areas of the city higher than 35 meters were forced into reliance on rainwater and wells until Constantine V repaired the line in 765 following a drought, according to Theophanes. Two issues of note before I conclude. First, comparison with the Sofular Speleothem in Bithynia now becomes salutary because it's more reflective than Uzantarla of Constantinople's considerably rainier weather, thanks to comparably greater input from Black Sea circulation and precipitation. The period between 626 and 765 was, apart from a pretty significant low uh, between 680 and 720, decidedly wet with higher than average isotopic values for effective moisture since about 540, going back a while. Such conditions may have ameliorated the loss of Val the Valens Aqueduct after 626, with rain becoming more available for cisterns in the city. Second and last, it is noteworthy that the 765 drought, which Theophanes claims is stimulus for Constantine V's repair of Valens Aqueduct, falls in a period with higher than average isotopic values on the Sofular record, albeit framed by several decades of declining moisture after more than a century without attested repairs on the lines. We can end then here with this caution. A single year's drought may well be invisible in Aspeliathem for now. But for further study, more important may be the year on year or the decadal changes that are within human memory that can create the perception of water abundance or scarcity and thereby can lend themselves to decisions and changes within a city's infrastructure. And so I think I'll just leave it there. So thank you very much for your attention. I look forward to questions.